The Bible verse is from 1 Peter 2, 2 to 10. Like newborn infants long for their pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourself like living stones are built up as a spiritual house to be holy priesthoods, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scriptures, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, those, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. A stumbling, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a holy nation of people for their own possessions, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, now you have received mercy. So in our scripture for today, we find Peter relaying the message about Jesus being the cornerstone. And indeed, we that believe can find this to be the truth in our own lives. Now, the cornerstone of a building in ancient times was the most important stone that was put into a building. It was the stone that was going to be laid first, making sure the rest of the structure would be sound. As such, it was common for stonemasons to reject stone after stone when selecting the cornerstone for the building. We find our scripture referencing the Messiah as the cornerstone throughout the Old and New Testament. There are many uh, uh, verses that talk about this. And specifically, we find reference that the people are going to reject the Messiah as the cornerstone. But God will place him as the starting point for all things. He will be the most important stone that will be laid in building his kingdom. Peter reminds us of that fact in verses 6 and 7, telling us that the cornerstone will be laid in Zion, and those that believe in him will not be put to shame. He gives us a warning that there will be many that will stumble on this stone because they will disobey his word. And finally, Peter leaves us with words of encouragement, reminding us that we are chosen by God, a royal priesthood, and that we will receive mercy because of our belief in Jesus as the cornerstone of our faith. Now, what a blessing to be able to claim for ourselves. But we don't think much about stones these days, do we? See, in the time of Peter, Stones were very important. All the major buildings were built of stone. All the walls around the big cities, they were made of stone. But when we think about stones today, it's usually something like a decorative stone, right? Like a nice stone accent wall or a stone chimney, perhaps, in a home. And maybe we only think about stones as a problem, like having to pick them out of our fields before you plow or plant. When I think about stones, the thing that comes to my mind is finding one that is small enough and smooth enough to see how far I can skip it across the river. That's where stones come into my brain. But throughout the Bible, the people that are followers of Christ, they are called to be living stones. And what does that mean? And why would we want to be a living stone? And what does it mean for us that our cornerstone was one that was rejected by the builders? Well, let's start there this morning talking about rejection. Rejection is never something that is easy for anyone to deal with. Often it comes with hurt feelings. Perhaps when we, uh, 
experience rejection, we're forced to look inward and see why we were rejected. Perhaps we were rejected because of something that we couldn't help. Maybe we face rejection because of who we are or what we believe. But no matter the reason for rejection, it is something that can stay with you for a very long time. I'm going to tell you a story about when I was rejected once. Now, when I was in the fifth grade, I had a crush on a young lady in my school. Oh, I thought she was the most wonderful, beautiful person that I had ever met. Now, being that I was 11 years old, I did what any self-respecting preteen would do. And I went to one of my friends and said, hey, can you go tell her that I'm deeply, madly in love with her? And I wanted her to be my girlfriend. But I was even a little bit more crafty than your average preteen. See, I arranged for the meeting and then I hid underneath a table so that I could listen to the conversation. And as my friend approached her, I became so nervous waiting to hear her answer. I was ready to spring up from underneath the table and yell, surprise, I'm right here. I knew that you liked me as well. Well, as my friend asked if she wanted to be my girlfriend, her reply came in the negative. Now her exact words were, and I do remember her exact words, no, I do not want to be his girlfriend. I do not date fat boys. Now, to be fair, I was a chubby little fellow at that time in my life. And please do not feel too harshly towards this young lady. We did go on to be really good friends uh, before I moved to Pennsylvania. But I tell you this story because that was over 25 years ago. And I still remember how much it hurt to be rejected in that manner. Again, I, I, those were her exact words, and I can still hear them being spoken. But this is nothing compared to the rejections that many of us have faced throughout our lives. I'm sure that each and every one of you carries your own scars from the rejections that you have dealt with. And it is certainly nothing compared to the rejection that Christ suffered. But when we think about rejection of people from people of this world, the good news is this about rejection. See, no matter who rejects us, and no matter the reason that they choose to do so, we are not rejected by God. You see, where others simply cast us aside as a stone that is unworthy of being part of their building, God has a way of seeing where he wants us to fit into his building. You see, God doesn't care if we're too round or if we're too rough around the edges for this world. He wants us to be a living stone added onto the cornerstone of Christ. And what a comforting thought for us, that our God is one that will choose us no matter the amount of rejections that we face. Now, we are called to be living stones just like Jesus. He is the cornerstone, the first living stone. See, our Savior is a living Savior. Our Savior is one that is still at work in this world. He is continuing to build his kingdom one stone at a time. And if we are to be like him, well, we are called to help st to add stones to his building as well. And that is what it is meant to be a living stone. It is not enough for us to just take our place in the building. We are called to add more stones as well. We often think of that as our great commission, right? To bring others to Christ. Sometimes we think of this commission as a burden. Often I hear things like, how can we do it? It is so hard. These people don't want to listen these days. These people just don't want to come to church anymore. Well, what are we to do? Where should we be looking? So as I pondered this question this week, and it's, if I'm honest, it's one that I ponder often, I thought about our scripture for the week, and I thought about how we are all stones that have been rejected in some way, just like Jesus. And I was reminded of the answer to this. Where do we go? Where do we look during our Bible study group this week? See, in our study, we have been looking at what it would mean to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And we've been studying the book, The Way by Adam Hamilton. And our chapter for this week was titled, Sinners, Outcasts, and the Poor. 
we were reminded this week that the majority of Christ's ministry was dedicated to helping those and preaching to those that were rejected by their society. You see, the answer to where we need to be looking for others to add to the stone pile is this. We need to go and look at the pile of stones that have already been rejected. The people that have been cast aside for whatever reason, the ones that have been rejected by our society today, we need to be looking to those people that Jesus would be looking to if he were walking among us. And I will go one step further here today, church. Perhaps the first place we should look is in the pile of stones that have been rejected by our church. Now I know that you are thinking we would never cast anyone aside. We would never do such a thing. And I know that we would have not intentionally ever done such a thing. But if we are honest with ourselves, we can recognize that this may have been done by accident. You see, I know that each and every one of you, and I include myself in that, can think about the people that used to sit in these pews. The people that used to worship with us every Sunday that are no longer here. What about the ones that came once or twice but didn't return? Well, maybe it's time for us to reach out to them again. Maybe we need to see if they want to be part of our group of stones once again. Now, you need to know that the answer might be no. And you need to be prepared for that. We talked earlier about rejection and how it hurts and stays with people, even if that rejection is done unintentionally. And if they say no, let us have the courage to then ask them why. Why do you not wish to come back? Again, we may not like the answer that we are given. But if we're willing to speak with them and to listen to their reasons, at the very least, we can find ways to make sure that we do not repeat the same mistake again. And at the very best, perhaps we can encourage them to join us once again. Now, I said earlier, sometimes we feel like this is a burden, this reaching out, that it cannot be done. Well, let me ask you to consider this thought this morning. What if no one had ever reached out to you? What if no one had ever reached out after Jesus' ministry on earth was finished? You see, we are not stones that stand alone. We are stones that have been added onto the other stones. Our cornerstone is Christ, but each and every person that has ever been added to that cornerstone has been added by the grace of God and by the work and ministry of others. Now, as a, a father of small children, I have the great pleasure of watching a lot of Disney movies. Those of you that have small children in your lives, you know that when a kid finds a movie that they like, you're going to watch it over and over again. And so often that you're going to learn all the songs in the movie. And you're going to probably learn all the dialogue as well. Well, in the movie Moana, there is a tradition among her people you see, the tall, on the tallest mountain, each chief of her tribe adds a stone to the, a pile when they become chief. That way their mountain grows with each generation. Now in this picture, you can see stone upon stone t uh, uh, stacked on top of each other. The ones at the bottom are covered in moss. Because we can see it tells the history of their people. Well, we get a chance to do the same thing, brothers and sisters. We get a chance to add a new stone onto the cornerstone. And that is a blessing, not a burden. We get a chance to continue the work of our people. A chance to add onto that pile of all the stones that have been laid before us. Think about that. For over 2,000 years, people have been adding stones to the cornerstone. And you are a part of that. So let us do just that. Let us be living stones for Christ. Let us find the ones that are rejected, just like our Savior, and bring them into the family of God. Who knows what wonderful things God will build if we just bring him the stones to do so. 
My challenge for you this week is this. Comb through the pile of rejected stones and the hopes of being able to add just one more stone to our pile. Amen.